I'm just going to leave this here. Is that all right? Absolutely. Okay. Can I just stand here? That's for me. Don't drink my drink. <laughs> Takes a minute. Now you're good. You're good. Thank you, everyone, for coming to our pediatric special grand rounds. Uh, I'm David Glenn, chair of pediatrics. For those of you who don't know me, I'm very excited. I've spent the day with Andy Garner. He is doing a visiting professorship, really, with us. And he, uh, we spent a couple hours this morning meeting with some folks. He went to Abington and did a community presentation. He's doing this tonight. Tomorrow morning, he's doing another community presentation here at the Millennium Center at 9. Then he's meeting with the residents from 11 to 1, and then he's getting on a plane and he's collapsing. And I, I'm so thrilled to have him here. I can't think of anybody better to introduce this theme, although I'm sure many of you are aware of it. I don't know anyone in the country who knows this better than, than Andy. Andy is a uniquely positioned individual to talk about early brain development, toxic stress, and the impact it should have on our medical education as well as our uh, community service and, and how we organize health systems. Andy went to Swarthmore undergrad where he met his wife. He went on to Case Western Reserve for medical school and a PhD in neurosciences. Mm -hmm. um, he was on a medical scientist track, did his uh, residency at uh, CHOP, but then made a life decision to decide to go into private practice rather than pursue the, uh, the science, more of a family decision. And then along came this whole issue around brain development, and Andy and I were on a committee together at the um, AAP, and I remember him pushing for a, you know, a technical report and a policy statement on toxic stress, and I was kind of scratching my head wondering, what is toxic stress? And he knew that all this stuff backwards and forwards. Anyway, he co-authored that, that statement, and then he chaired the working group for the American Academy on early brain development, and it just is an incredible spokesman, incredible advocate for children, and I'm thrilled that he's here to present this to us. Thank you. Boy, you, you've set the bar, hard for, by the bar high for me there. I don't know. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. And most of all, though, thanks to all of you for being here on a Monday night. I mean, <laughs> that's a weird time for grand rounds. And so I apologize. And I'll try and make sure I make it worth your while. Um, so um, what I'm really going to be talking about tonight is some, some advances in the basic sciences of development. It really gets down to basic science, because I'm going to talk about a lot of different things and people will say, boy, you covered a lot of material, and I'll, I'll try not to talk too fast. But um, the thing that's really going to be driving my talk uh, are these advances in the basic sciences, because these advances are really uh, allowing us to sort of peer into that proverbial black box. And, and that black box, in my mind, is a black box that links adversity in childhood with a slew of outcomes decades down the line. So these sciences are really providing a better understanding of the biology that's underlying well-established associations. Now, that's not to say that it's destiny when you have an, an adverse childhood experience, but it, it, we're kidding ourselves to not acknowledge that there is a change in the risk factors, the risk and probabilities there. So these advances in science, epigenetics, neuroscience, life course trajectories, they're really forcing us to reconsider the childhood origins for lifelong health and disease. Because a lot of chronic disease actually is adult manifest disease of things that actually happen in, in childhood. So as a consequence, it's really challenging us to do a better job of trying to get things right the first time. Because we find that we're constantly remedi remediating, fixing, or repairing what seem like intractable problems. Um, uh, but if we got things right the first time, and by things I mean genomic function, brain function, early relationships, we can do a lot better preventing those problems in the first place. Now, as a primary care pediatrician, I'll be the first to tell you that change is hard. Right? So I have no illusions that translating the science I'm going to talk about into practice and policy is going to be easy. In fact, I think it's going to require an unprecedented level of collaboration and silo busting. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, how we need a public health approach to address these issues. Um, but what I really want to convince you in the next 45 minutes or so is that in addition to being a tremendous challenge, it's almost an unprecedented opportunity. Right? And therefore, it's uh, a challenge we can ill afford not to tackle, not only as a profession, but really as a society. So I have a few learning objectives, but before I get to those disclosures, um, I won't be discussing any off-label indications. And as a lowly primary care pediatrician, I can ensure you that there are no financial institutions that are interested in paying me anything. 
<clears throat> if you don't know how I can change that, let me know. Um, so I have a few uh, learning objectives. I'm going to briefly explain the significance of some recent advances in the basic science of development. Describe what I really think, particularly for medical education, is a different model. You know, we have this biomedical model, we have the biopsychosocial model, and the thing that they both lack is an understanding of time, about how the benefits and risks to health and disease are built. It's a cumulative process. And so we need to start thinking developmentally. Um, and then I'm going to try and reframe some vague concepts, concepts like adversity and resilience. What does that mean in the context of the biology? Um, I'm also going to have a, a few critical concepts. And the first one is this one. It comes from Life's Course Science. And it tells us that experiences in childhood, both good and bad, so there's two edges to this sword here, um, are strongly associated with behaviors, health, and economic productivity decades down the line. So like I mentioned before, Childhood experiences, they're not destiny, right? So we all know from our experience, kids that have had every advantage, material advantage in the world and done very poorly, and conversely, kids that have gone through horrific experiences and actually done pretty well. So this is not destiny, but it's clear that those experiences change probabilities in a, in a, in a significant way. They cast a long shadow, if you will, over across the life course. Uh, and so the really challenge before us is what are the mechanisms underlying those associations? Because if we know the mechanisms that are underlying them, then maybe we can do a better job of, of um, preventing those uh, long-term outcomes. So as I said before, there's this proverbial black box where you have a childhood experience, and then it's linked with adult outcomes. And when we think about childhood diversity, it's a shame that thing's up there. Can I get rid of that somehow? Do I click this? No, oh, that was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Can I drag? Ah, oh, yay. Thank you. Okay. I'm having some toxic stress. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so when we think about childhood the, in terms of adversity, we're going to talk a little bit about this study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And I'll tell you what that is all in a, in a minute. But when we think about childhood adversity, we tend to think catastrophic. We tend to think violence. Kids been abused, witnessed violence. But the truth is, there are sources of adversity that are just common and mundane. Growing up in poverty, growing up with a mom who's had um, um, uh, issues with substance abuse or depression. The point is that those we know are strongly associated with poor health, academic failure, and economic hardship. But the good news is, the other side's true as well. If we make significant investments in parent engagement, quality childcare, and even just having the time to play with our kids, those are associated with better outcomes in terms of health, academic success, and economic stability. So, you know, the, it's not the you know, $50,000 question. It's not the million-dollar question. It's the, like, $3 trillion question is what's going on inside the box, right? So I think we can learn a lot by looking at um, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And, and if people aren't familiar with that study, that's okay. I'm going to tell you all about it. But um, don't feel bad. One of my um, colleagues likes to say the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is the most important study you've probably never heard of, right? Um, so... <clears throat> what did they do in the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? They looked at, and this happened in the 1990s, 17,000 was the end, more than 17, so 17,000 middle-class, middle-aged Americans in San Diego. Um, most of them had had some college, most of them were in their 50s, and they asked them, prior to the age of 18, if they had experienced any of 10 different categories of adversity. So the categories were three categories of abuse, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, Five measures of household dysfunction, a mother being treated violently, household substance abuse, household mental illness, parental separation, divorce, an incarcerated household member, and then two uh, measures of neglect. Um, and as you can see from the slide, they are really, really common, right? And this was a middle class um, you know, um, population in San Diego, right? So when this data came out, there was a huge uproar, and people were like, this can't be true. There's no way this is true. Well, it turns out it is true, um, and it's been replicated in other communities. And of course, some communities you look at, you're going to see more. So these ACEs are actually over um, uh, um, present in terms of like people that are incarcerated, right? Overrepresented in those in those populations. So, look at this: one in four um, experienced physical abuse prior to the age of 18, and household substance abuse prior to the age of 18, um, and almost one in five, or about one in five, experienced sexual abuse. Household mental illness or parental separation and divorce. So again, um, when this data first came out, even the investigator that did this thought he had made a mistake, <laughs> right? So he actually went out and had his colleagues repeat it and found, no, this really is true. So they wanted to come up with a way of trying to quantify this adversity. 
So they came up with a very simple ACE score. So what's an ACE score? You get one point for each one of the different categories. So I think the ACE score is important for people to understand, but we have to acknowledge it actually is a very poor measure of adversity for several reasons. One, there's issues with recall. They're asking people in their 50s what happened to them prior to the age of 18, and we know we tend to suppress things we don't want to think about, right? So it underrepresents the trauma. There are also issues with repetition. So if you were sexually abused once or sexually abused every other day for a week, still just one point, right? And then there's issues with redundancy within each category. So if your mom preferred heroin and your dad liked marijuana, it's still just one point for substance abuse. So the point is the A score has its limitations. It's a poor measure of adversity. But despite that, despite that, they were able to show that the higher your A score, there was a graded, dose-dependent and statistically significant effect. The higher your ACE score, the higher all of these outcomes. So this slide is a little overwhelming, right? Hopefully there's something on there that interests everyone, <laughs> something that you're, you're passionate about, right? Um, but when I see this slide, I don't see overwhelming. I see opportunity, right? Because if we can, again, go back to the mechanisms and understand what's driving childhood adversity towards these outcomes, Think about the huge effect we can have. We're not just in healthcare, right? Economic productivity, mental health, the whole shebang, right? And it gets even more promising if you consider these big five. And I know I circled six, I can count. Um, but um, I tend to l lump illicit drugs and IV drugs just into substance abuse. So if you look at those big five, smoking, alcoholism, promiscuity, obesity, and substance abuse, they actually relate to almost everything else that's on the slide. So if you're a smoker, well, duh, you're going to have more likely probability of having chronic lung disease. And if you're an alcoholic, you're going to be more likely to have liver disease. Uh, and if you're obese, you're going to have problems with cardiovascular disease. And we, we know that substance abuse is tightly linked with mental health issues. Um, so what are those big five, if they're driving a lot of this, what do those big five things have in common? Well, the physiologists would tell us they're examples of behavioral allostasis. What the heck does that mean? So, you know, there's this idea of homeostasis. We try and stay in a certain place. When the environment pushes us, allostasis is the active response on our part to get back to normal. These are all things that people do to turn off stress, right? Um, so the, the issue is that these are things that, on the short term, are actually adaptive, right? Because we tend to think of them as being poor choices, unhealthy lifestyles, weak character, right? They're actually adaptive initially, but then you get trapped. One of the um, patients actually in the ACE study said, very insightful, said to one of the leaders, you know, doc, it's really hard to get enough of something that almost works. All five of those things, they almost work. And so for us to say, that's a bad choice, that's easy to say, um, but the reality is that we, we're kidding ourselves if we don't acknowledge that at some point in the past that may have actually been a somewhat adaptive response. Now in a different context, it's a maladaptive response. So, so if we're going to develop a model of health and disease, and we're going to incorporate this life course science, what we would say is that the ecology, and by the ecology, I don't mean just the physical ecology. I mean the social emotional milieu, the relational ecology the child's growing up in, that is strongly associated with lifelong developmental outcomes in learning, behavior, and health. And it's, it's association, so I put it there sort of in a dashed line, right? It's not destiny, but there are strong associations. So the question, of course, is, you know, what are the mechanisms that are underlying this association? And if we're going to try and tease this stuff apart, we've got to get a better measure of the ecology. How do we measure the ecology? Or even more, how do we measure adversity, right? So when you start talking about adversity and stress, that gets tricky. You're never going to get a good measure of stress if you're looking at the precipitants, right? There's huge variability. You know, one child hears a dog barking and thinks, ooh, puppy, let's play. And another's like, ooh, terrified. Now, some of that has to do with their previous experience. But the point is, the precipitant's not going to help you figure out whether that was a stressful event or not. So when we talk about toxic stress and stress in general, we want to ground it in the physiologic response, the response. That's more objective, right? We know what happens there. Hypothalamus, you know, or the amygdala, the hypothalamus, you know, all that, right? And I'll go over that in a second just to refresh everyone's memory. But the point is, Jack Shankoff and his colleagues said, look, if we're going to get a handle on stress, 
we need to acknowledge there's positive stress, there's tolerable stress, and there's toxic stress. And that's all based on the objective physiologic responses. So we're talking about stress responses, not the precipitants. So not to insult anyone's uh, intelligence, but I, you know, I had a PhD in neuroscience. I still have to remind myself of all the stress response and what happens. So um, you know, the thought is that a lot of the stress response, the trigger for the stress response is the amygdala. Right? When there's threat recognition, the amygdala sounds the alarm. So the way I sometimes explain the amygdala is, um, you know, a couple years ago, Nike had a campaign, just do it, right? The amygdala is the just do it center, right? <laughs> it just, you just do it. There's no thought involved. If you've ever been like walking in the woods and jumped back and then realized, oh, it's just a stick, but before I even thought about it, it made me jump because I thought it was a snake. That's your amygdala. That's keeping you safe, right? Um, so that sends a signal to the hypothalamus, and there are actually two different pathways then. The HPA, hypothalamic paraventricular nucleus sends out um, CRH, which goes to the pituitary, which releases ACTH, which goes to the adrenal cortex, and we get cortisol. There's also the SAM pathway, the sympathomimetic pathway, where the hypothalamic spinal tract goes to the sympathetic nervous system, which goes to the adrenal medulla, not the cortex, where we get epinephrine and norepinephrine. But the important point actually isn't this. The important point are, what are the regulators of this? What are the things that regulate whether that, either one of those stress responses is on or off? Well, important ones actually list, uh, exist in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. Why? Because they conspire to turn off the amygdala. They say, whoa, Nelly. Let's think about this. We got some other options here, right? Um, cortisol itself is part of a negative feedback loop. It binds to uh, receptors in the hypo, uh, hypothalamus and the, and the pituitary to turn off the stress response. So you don't constantly spiral out of control. You bring it back down, right? And then this is really interesting area of research here. Um, the parasympathetic and vagal nerve, you know, they also turn off the sympathetic response. So there's a lot of interest in polyvagal therapy and how we can use the vagal nerve to help turn off the sympathetic response. All right, so with that background then, what the heck is positive stress? Positive stress is a stress response, right, that's brief, it's infrequent, it's mild to moderate intensity, and it's what most kids experience, right? So a kid who is 15 months old and can't tell you, I want the cup. Right? Well, you read their expressions, you give it to them, stress comes down, right? Um, the two-year-old who stumbles by running, and man, this is falling because I just fell and skinned my knee, right? Um, the kid who's beginning childcare, you know, you're coming back, right? Um, and then even for middle schoolers, that big project that's over a course of months, right? You can break it up into little bits. It's not so overwhelming. The point is that positive stress is defined by the presence of these social emotional buffers that allow that stress response to be brief and return to baseline. You're not swimming in the mediators anymore, right? Um, it actually builds motivation and resiliency, right? And the important point is this, you can't see it. Man, I gotta get rid of this thing, it's driving me nuts. Um, how about up here, there we go. Um, it builds, um, positive stress is not the absence of stress. We're not putting kids in a bubble, right? We're giving them the skills so they can deal with stress in an adaptive, healthy way. All right, so what is toxic stress? It's longer lasting, it's more frequent, stronger intensity, and you can see how the adverse child experiences could potentially precipitate a toxic stress response because it's really hard to get enough social emotional buffering to turn off that stress response. Not impossible, but a lot harder. Um, and as a consequence, those experiences induce change. They literally get into your body. They change the way your genome functions. It changes the way your brain functions. And it's not necessarily, again, a bad thing. It may be adaptive initially, but it may be maladaptive down the line. Um, so epigenetics and brain architectures. Let's talk a little bit about those. So epigenetics, you know, I'm showing my age when I talk about The Graduate. You remember the movie The Graduate, Dustin Huffman? And he goes to the, the father-in-law or whatever. He's like, plastics. It's all about plastics. You got to know plastics, right? If I were advising medical students now, I would say epigenetics. <laughs> epigenetics. you got to know epigenetics because it's going to, I'm telling you, it's going to change the way we think about medicine. I mean, just think 15 years ago before the human genome was cloned, we thought that was the holy grail. Once we had the DNA sequence, it was over. We knew everything, right? No. It's how those genes get turned on, the complement the genes that are turned on in any, in any individual cell. And what controls that? Right? So that's a whole different perspective. So anyway, epigenetics means above the genome. It refers to changes in gene expression with no change in the DNA sequence. So you have not changed the DNA sequence, you determine which complemented genes are turned on and turned off. 
It's really part of this much larger revolution in genomic science, because the old view was one, your genes are your destiny. It's the Huntington's disease model, right? You get that gene, you know what's gonna happen, right? The reality is that's not true for the vast majority of genes, and the new view is that the, the genome is actually somewhat plastic, right? It's sensitive to the environment. So the experts say, look, if you wanna think about the genome, think about it as a very, very complex set of switches. Millions of switches, because a gene is either turned on and transcribed or turned off. It's on or off. It's, it's, a, it's a switch. And some are massive switches. So you turn on that gene, you turn on a whole developmental program, right? Some of them are dynamic, which makes sense, too, because we have circadian rhythms. You know, genes on and off over a period of time. But this is the kicker. Some of them are programmed very early in life and are very, very stable, not only across your lifespan, but even to subsequent lifespans. Wow. Right? That changes everything. Now the genome, much like the brain, is sensitive to environmental input. Right? So the, you may have heard that aphorism, the genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. Right? This is what it's getting at. Right? So uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics likes a less violent analogy. Um, and so what, <laughs> so what they say is epigenetics, not your parents' genome. Right? The idea that just because you inherit the same genes as your parents do doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to interact in the same way. So, for example, if you inherit a gene that makes it very likely for you to be an alcoholic, but the environment never turns that gene on, is that really a risk factor? That's good news, right? So this is good news, epigenetics. Now, having said that, I'm going to give you an example that's bad news. But I don't want you to think that I'm picking on, parent, on moms, right? And I'll, I'll tell you why at the end. So one example of this is we know that there's significant stress in the last trimester of pregnancy um, that that can result in the methylation of the fetus's glucocorticoid receptor. Why is that a problem? That's, a methyl, that's, that's epigenetics. Why is that a problem? Because when you methylate that fetal glucocorticoid receptor gene, you decrease the expression of that receptor in the brain. Why is that a problem? Well, I told you, cortisol is part of the feedback loop that turns it off. No receptor, no turning it off. You've released the break on the stress system. And in fact, you find newborns that have higher reactivity, higher cortisol levels, and, and basically um, state irregularities. They, they, they're hard to console, right? Which is a pretty good definition of toxic stress. So you can see how early stress can lead to a vicious cycle. Now, I'm not picking on moms. Dads have an influence as well. And this is not thought to be irreversible, right? So if in that last trimester of pregnancy, you're supplying the appropriate social supports, mindfulness, that sort of thing, we think those methylation patterns are, are reversible, right? But this is an example of, are we taking what we know and translating it into what we do? Are we making sure that all pregnant moms have access to care? That they have social supports and something like Lamaze on steroids. You know what I mean? I got that social network, right? Are, are we giving them uh, family medical leave? Are we giving them paid maternal leave? You know, those, those are things that clearly have implications from the science. All right. No moms feel picked on, right? Good. All right. So if we're going to incorporate all this into our model, then we would say through epigenetic mechanisms, the early childhood ecology becomes biologically embedded, right? influencing how and which genes are used. So we have physiologic adaptations and disruptions. And whether it's a disruption or an adaptation depends on the future context. You don't really know yet. It may be adaptive initially, but it may be maladaptive down the line. All right, developmental neuroscience. We know that brain architecture is experience dependent, right? For the brain, I mean, we've known this for way back in Hubel and Wiesel with the covering the patch of the cat's eye, right? I mean, experience is really um, uh, important. Um, the ecology then influences how the brain is formed initially and then also how it's remodeled over time. And of course, when we're talking about remodeling in response to experience, we're talking about plasticity. The thing is, we know that the cellular plasticity, and you know, there's synaptic and cellular plasticity, the cellular plasticity appears to be declining over time. There are certain parts of the brain that remain strong, but the point is overall, cellular plasticity diminishes over time, which means it's a lot harder to teach an old dog new tricks. You gotta get it right the first time, right? The more important thing is that not all parts of the brain come online at the same time. There's differential maturation of parts in the brain. So I talked before that the on switch for the stress response is the amygdala. It comes to maturation relatively early, structurally, biologically, looking in scans. It comes to maturation relatively early, right? The off switches, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, they actually mature much later, right? So, and, and the prefrontal cortex isn't completely structurally mature until you're 24, 
right? So it's never too late to help adolescents, right? There's hope for all of them, right? Um, but the point is, through most of development, the on switch, the amygdala, is screaming, right? And the prefrontal cortex is still finding its voice. Now, that makes a lot of sense developmentally, right? When you're a kid, you're not sure what's safe and what isn't safe. It's better to shoot first and ask questions later, right? But then as you get older, you know, a little more information, a little more wisdom, you don't need to do that too much. You know, you have some options and think about it a little much. It also makes sense in terms of our own experience, right? So when there's no emotion involved, when there's no amygdala screaming at us, we make great decisions, and particularly teenagers, right? So this is the reason why we have graduated driver's license in teenagers, right? You know, if there's no distractions, no emotion, no girlfriend in the car, they can make good decisions, right? But man, little emotion, whew, forget it. You know, as soon as you involve that amygdala, mm, it's screaming. The prefrontal cortex is a lot harder to hear. We, we have it in our own experience, too, right? We make good decisions when we're cool, calm, and collected, but when we're panicked, not so much. All right, so the point is, because of that differential maturation, if there's significant adversity, it can also lead to a vicious cycle. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. The point is that early experiences create potentially permanent alterations in brain architecture and functioning. So again, if there's significant childhood stress, because of the differential maturation with the on switch screaming and the off switch still finding its voice, it can lead to a chronic stress response. And because of plasticity in the brain, that can lead to changes in the actual architecture and wiring of the brain. So if you look at Romanian orphans, right, who have been severely neglected, they literally have bigger amygdalas. They're bigger, right? Big, strong, <coughs> muscle strong amygdalas. And then the thing is, though, if you look at moms or look at children who are around moms who are depressed, they also have bigger amygdalas. So again, it's not just catastrophic, it's routine things that can also result in changes in the brain architecture. These kids are harder to calm, and as a consequence, they sort of have this toxic stress. So for incorporating this into our model, we would say, you know, declining plasticity in the developing brain results in potentially permanent alterations in brain functioning and development. Potentially, potentially. And again, the younger you are, the more we can do about it, right? All right. So. Another thing I should point out, though, is that you know, I tend to think about the brain, um, but there are many end organs for toxic stress, right? There's the genome, and it's more than just methylation patterns. Chronic stress appears to have um, changes in telomere lengths, base pair mismatch repair, um, uh, many things in terms of the genomic function. Um, the brain, we talked about changes in the structure and function of those three main places. Endocrine, obviously, changes in what the sort of the uh, acute stress reactivity, so in terms of immediate stress, but then also chronic basal levels, there are changes, right? Um, there's changes in the immune system, because we know that cortisol plays a role in turning on and off the immune regulation, and of course, issues with surveillance are associated with a lot of autoimmune diseases, asthma, diabetes, cancer, and then of course, the cardiovascular system. And this is the real kicker for the cardiovascular system. So in the beginning, I mentioned that um, you know, a lot of the um, consequences you can um, understand in the context of behavioral allostasis, all those things that people do. The thing that's amazing about the cardiovascular risk, and it's true for some of the other things as well, even if you take out the smoking, the obesity, all the big five, having a higher ACE score in childhood still increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. There's something going on very early that's setting the, and priming the well for a dog-eat-dog -dog world, it's going to end up causing problems down the line. All right, so if we incorporate all this into our model, again, we would say that the ecology uh, through life course science tells us that it has an impact on, on the development. Epigenetics helps explain biological adaptations versus disruptions. The neuroendocrine immune axis, if you will, can help explain how those changes affect development, not only 0 to 3, 0 to 18, but across the lifespan. Um, so this new model then would be that the ecology becomes biology, and that dance, that ongoing cumulative dance between the ecology and the biology literally drive development, not zero to three, not zero to 18, but across the lifespan. This is really important, because it's a completely different model, because now we have time, a dimension of time in there, and it changes the way we see our roles as physicians, because the, the, the traditional biomedical model is, what's wrong with you? What is wrong with you, and how can I fix it, right? If you really believe that the ecologies are playing a critical role in defining how the biology happens, the question is, what's happened to you? Tell me your story. I need to understand you. That's a completely different response, and my response is not, how do I fix it? I can't fix what's happened to you. I need to listen. I need to be empathic. And that response, that 
empathic response is what's building that therapeutic relationship upon everything else we do. And I think we've lost a lot of that, particularly with electronic medical records, right? Click, 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 click. I'll get to that in a second. Click, 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 click. You gotta be kidding me. It's hard to find a therapeutic relationship in that. So I think this is an important thing in terms of medical education because what we're gonna be talking about a little bit is trying to encourage people to go upstream and look at these social determinants of health and the ecology. I think one of the reasons we don't do that is not so much um, we don't have an intervention. And I, yes, I know, we need to have interventions in place. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I'll push back a little bit on that in the sense that um, uh, one of the interventions is actually having that discussion, taking the skeletons out of the closet, building that relationship with, with, with the person. Um, so I, so that, that's an important part of, of, what, of what, we, what we need to do in order to move forward. I lost my train of thought, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's, it's been a long day. <laughs> um, so uh, the point is, it changes the way we think about our relationship. We need to do, oh, all right, I was thinking, if we're gonna encourage physicians to go upstream and start talking about these social determinants of health, we have to acknowledge that there is uh, another reason for asking, aside from I don't have, and an, again, if the response is I need to fix you, then that's really stressful. If the response is I just need to listen, that's a different thing. But I think a lot of times we don't ask about these things because there are times we don't wanna hear it. It's vicarious trauma. If I hear one more sob story, I'm gonna lose my mind, right? And so I think we're doing an injustice to the next generation of physicians if we're saying, these social determinants of health, they're really important, you need to identify them. You don't necessarily need to fix them, but you need to, you need to identify them without saying to them, there's a cost to you, right? But if your approach is, I need to listen and be empathic and form a relationship, that's a whole different thing. It's a lot easier to walk away other than, I didn't fix this, I didn't fix this, this mom looked at that, I didn't fix this. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe I'm rambling, but, but I think it's a different approach. Anyway, in the center here, um, we have the basic science of pediatrics. This is nothing new, right? So Julius Richmond 50 years ago said, the basic science of pediatrics is development. That is our basic science. So it's also the basic science of early brain and child development. And like I discussed, it's informed by epigenetics, the physiology of stress, the neuroscience. And we tend to think in our silo in health. Health is the outcome, right? But the reality is it's the same science that underlies the foundations of education and economic development, right? And so we have this one science with many, many implications. And so the challenge is how we've been translating that science into what we do, into uh, policy and practice. So I'm not sure I have all the answers, but I think it begins, again, with a different framework. So Buckminster Fuller one time said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change things, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. I think we would acknowledge that our existing reality is not working <laughs> in terms of healthcare. It's, it's not working. We're paying lots of money. We're getting worse outcomes. We need to change the existing reality. I like to think that one way of trying to do that is to change our fr framework. And I think there's some advantages to this eco-biodevelopmental framework. The first is that even though it's really grounded in science, I mean, hardcore molecular cellular science, it's relatively easy to understand to say the ecology becomes biology and the dance, you know, affects development, hopefully that will drive support for translation. And this is an important point because as advocates for children, pediatricians and otherwise, we tend um, to argue what's the right thing to do ethically. You know, it's the right thing to do morally. I mean, how can you not, you know, how can you blame the kids for what the parents have done, right? And there's an argument to be made for that. We also say it's the right thing to do economically, right? James Heckman, lots of other people. And that's true. But we're not legal scholars, we're not econ economists. At heart, I like to think we're biologists, right? And now we can make the argument, investments in childhood, that's the right thing to do biologically. That should be in our wheelhouse. Um, the other thing is that it gets away from this idea of mind-body dualism, right? The idea that, oh, you got these psychosocial stressors, um, and then you've got the biology, and there are separate things, and there's mental health, and there's physical health. That's not the case. With this, the, the, the salient features of the ecology, that psychosocial milieu, is every bit as biological as lead or nutrition, right? It gets under your skin and infects the way, impacts the way the genome works. Um, so there's no distinction between mental and physical health. And in, in this model, the distinction is, was the adaptations, the changes, healthy or unhealthy? Were they adaptive or maladaptive? Like I mentioned before, it adds this idea of time to reflect this ongoing cumulative dance. Um, 
So what do I mean by that? Well, we just talked about the fact that experiences, good or bad, um, can lead to alterations in the way the genome is read and utilized. And it also changes, uh, results in alterations in brain structure and function. And what's the ultimate output of all that? It's behavior. And we tend to think about that's where it stops. But in reality, it doesn't stop there. If the kid has a tantrum, that experiences the next, influences the next experience, right? It's an ongoing cumulative dance. And the foundations have an impact upon what happens next. All right, so another advantage of this framework is that if we're really serious, because we talk about disparities a lot, and we talk about how can we improve developmental life course trajectories, if we're really serious about that, we need to start looking at the ecology. We gotta get the ecology right. But how do you do that? We can't do that in our hospitals. <laughs> we can't do that in our clinics. We can't do that just as a medical profession, right? This is gonna take a public health approach. We need our public health colleagues, we need the educational colleagues, the social services, right? It's gonna require more than what we can do alone. Now, I'm not, that, I'm not saying we're not necessary, I'm just saying we're not sufficient to uh, do this change. Um, and it highlights the pivotal role of toxic stress, right? It's not just step on the gas. So this is an important distinction. The educational model, in terms of improving outcomes, has always been Stimulate, stimulate, stimulate. Read, read, read. Leapfrogs for everyone, right? And to a certain extent, that's true. They need to have those experiences. I just told you, experiences are important. But the medical model is telling us, before you step on that gas, you better release the brake. If you don't release the brake and the brain's not ready to take up those experiences, you're wasting your time. And what's the brake? It's that stress, right? So um, some of you uh, may be familiar with um, Montessori. Right? So this idea of releasing the brake is not, not, a, not a new one. It's an old idea. So Montessori is known for educational pursuits, but she actually was a pediatrician. She was the first female pediatrician in Italy. Right? And she was assigned to work with the kids that were severely delayed. Uh, and what she discovered was it didn't matter how delayed they were. They still had this drive to master. Whether it was dropping the pen, dropping the pen, dropping the pen, dropping the pen, until, okay, I got that. I can do that. Now I'm going to do something else. Right? And so that informs her whole educational theory, which was education is not something we do to kids. There's a drive for them to master. We need to just set up the environment to allow them to succeed. Also, Vygotsky gets into this, too, um, about his theories of play. The point is that there is a drive to master that's there. We just have to take the break off and allow it to happen. So that sounds great. That's around the turn of the century. You may be familiar with Maslow, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? He had the same sort of idea. He talked about self-actualization. That's what we want for all of our kids, right? To be self-driven, to want to know, to understand, to be the best they can be. That's what we want for our kids. But he also said, you're not going to see that drive unless you meet some more basic needs first, right? They need to have the physiological needs met. They need to feel safe. They need to feel attached and belonging and, and valued. They need to have ac actual opportunities to succeed. And then you're going to see that. So let's stop and think about that a little bit. Because one of the big things we're talking about a lot to, these days is um, kindergarten readiness. How can we have our kids ready for kindergarten, right? And it turns out that's also linked a lot with health, right? If, and so if our goal is for kids to come to school ready to learn, are they really going to be self-actualizing and ready to learn if they come to school, but they didn't sleep the night before or they didn't have breakfast? Maslow is saying no, and it sort of makes sense, right? Um, are they going to come to school ready to learn if they're worried about the bully on the bus? Are they going to come to school ready to learn if there's no teacher there that knows whether they're there or not there from one day to the next? Are they going to come to school ready to learn if they're not an Einstein, but they're really good at art and music, but we just hacked that because we don't have the funds? And so they have no self-esteem, no attachment to the school. So you can see you know, how we put these barriers in place to make it harder for kids to live up to their potential. So the thing that's challenging, though, is I don't think we look at the parents as well, a two-generational approach. Because I have yet to meet a parent who says, I want to suck at this, right? Every parent wants to be a good parent, right? They want to be a good parent. And so the problem is, if their goal is to be the parent I always dreamed I would be, to be the best parent I can be, that's my goal. Are they really going to have that level of self-actualization if they don't know where they're going to sleep that night and they don't know where their next meal is coming from? We haven't met their physiologic needs. Are they really going to be that way if they're worried about domestic violence? Are they really going to be that way if because of mobility today, there's no extended family there for them? They're socially isolated. Their neighbors don't even know where they live or die, right? Are they really going to be the parent they want to be if they don't have a job? Right? So you just walk your way up the, you know, so I think that sometimes parents get a bad rap because I, I believe parents, want, they may not, we put barriers after barriers and make it harder for them 
to be the parents they want to be. All right, so Maslow, you have this, this 1943, right? So, you know, 60, 70 years later, this still rings true, right? But it's just, it's theoretical, right? Where's the data behind this? Well, it turns out there's a group called America's Promise Alliance, and they looked at five promises. Five promises, which line up conveniently very nicely with Maslow's needs, right? They say for kids to do well, they need to have a healthy start, safe places, caring families, opportunities to contribute, and effective education. That sounds great. And what they discovered was, geez, if you have the five promises, if you get four of these, if you get any four of these promises, right, it basically mitigates disparities in health and education. Holy cow, right? We worry about disparities. We know what we can do to fix it. The problem is, how many kids in the United States have four or five of the promises met? A third. One third. One third. How many kids do you think have zero or one of the promises met? 20%. And that's across the country. Some areas, likely much higher, right? That's untenable, right? We can't afford to discard a quarter of our kids, you know, or 20 or 20 20 percent of our kids. And and my feeling is that what this gets to it challenges this long seated, cherished notion of equal opportunity. That's what America's all about: equal opportunity. Every kid's got a fair shot. I would say that's a biologic fallacy. If you have zero or one of these promises met, and we know the consequence of toxic stress on your genome and brain, you're walking a much higher mountain. So anyway, so in terms of reinventing the wheel all over again, this, the teachers also said, hey, you know what? We're going to have a new compact, a whole child compact. And look what they said they got to come up with. It's the same sort of things, <laughs> right? Yeah, so it's reinventing the wheel all over again. So the point is, we have to release the brake. We have to get rid of toxic stress so we have a chance to step on the gas. All right, so unmet needs in childhood are potential precipitants of toxic stress. Not absolute, there's just potential. But there's a flip side to this, and that is unmet needs in childhood are potential barriers to relational health. If you think about that, and that's why I talked about the parents and the kids, if you have those things there, it makes it really hard for the parents and the kids to interact in a meaningful way, to have safe, stable, and nurturing relationships. So that changes things. Now we can start thinking about adversity and resilience at the biological level, right? So adversity leads to physiologic stress. That stress response can be positive if it's buffered by safe, stable, nurturing relationships, or it can be toxic if they're not available. And resilience is the ability to handle that adversity in a healthy way, an adaptive way. In the presence of safe, stable, nurturing relationships, um, uh, that builds positive, positive stress and it builds um, motivation and resilience. In the absence, we have maladaptive responses. So what really what it comes down to is this, I know it seems touchy-feely, but it's relational health. Does someone get me? Does someone understand me? And there's lots of data out there that social isolation is what's driving a lot of our chronic diseases. Social isolation. All right, so what's inside the box? Toxic stress, on the adverse side, we're looking at toxic stress, epigenetic changes, and disruptions in brain and architecture, and, 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 and also uh, behavioral allostasis. Remember the big five, right? On the positive side, we're looking at safe, stable, nurturing relationships. There's this idea of social emotional learning. So when, when kids get into school, there is formalized social emotional learning. So these skills are skills that can be learned, right? They're not, you know, if a kid's bad at math, we don't say it sucks to be you, you know, we're going to teach you those skills, right? Um, and then it leads to healthy adaptations. So the big questions are, since toxic stress is a mediator, it mediates the relationship between uh, ACEs and adult outcomes, are there ways to treat, uh, mitigate, or prevent toxic stress? And the corollary is, since relational health is the antidote to toxic stress, are there ways to repair, eliminate barriers to, or even promote relational health? And if so, why are we not actually doing it? Is there a disconnect between what we know and what we do? All right, so I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, and, and I have a public health pyramid here, right? At the very, very top, we've got the kids who we know have experienced toxic stress, and they're not doing very well. So we've got to treat toxic stress. We need to repair the relational health. But it begins with the acknowledgement that it's not what's wrong with you. It's what's happened to you, right? And we're going to repair that relationship through parent-child interaction therapy, um, child-parent psychotherapy. These are evidence-based. And what do they do? They're looking at relational health. It's dyadic. It's all dyadic. Now, I understand if you don't have it in your neighborhood, that doesn't help you very much. So we've got to be advocates for things that we know that work. 
We know that those things decline over time, though, the efficacy. So that's probably related to declining brain plasticity. The problem is, this is reactive. The maladaption is already happening. That's why we know the kid's there. The kid's having a tantrum before you. The kid has anxiety. Um, so the interventions, and again, the access is an issue. The interventions need to be local. So we need more providers, better advocacy. I think as physicians, we're really good advocates, and people listen to us if it's not something that's putting money in our pockets. So if we're saying, geez, we really need parent-child interaction therapy, you know? Well, how does that help you? What helps me take care of kids? It's not helping my money, but it's really important for the kids. Ooh. I mean, we're actually very good advocates when we're advocating for things that aren't necessary for us, and people tend to listen. Um, we need a universal program uh, or a, a local platform to identify which kids need these services, though. So again, once kids hit preschool and school, the schools are a natural uh, opportunity. But less than three, I gotta think we got to think about the medical home, because we're seeing these, these kids and families and other people aren't. So if we want to try and promote relational health, um, what can we do about that? Well, we can identify the kids that are, or sorry, reducing barriers to relational health. This is the second level, mitigating toxic stress, reducing the, the barriers to relational health. We would try to focus on the kids that were at highest risk, and then we would do evidence-based interventions, things like home visiting programs, and there are a number of models for that. Parenting programs, there are another models for that. Um, but there are issues with stigma now, right? So when you get to this level, you've been identified, you need additional help. That's sort of stigma-inducing, right? Uh, and of course, there's issues with access. But there's a bigger issue, too, and that is, how do we decide who's at risk? And this gets, again, at this idea of the ecology, because we, as a pediatricians, we tend to look at the child, and that kid's dysfunctional. He's having a tantrum, he has ADHD, he has anxiety, there's something wrong with the child, he's diagnosable, there's dysfunction there. But ideally, we'd like to go a little bit upstream. Okay, so what are the risks for the child? Well, it turns out a lot of the risks for the child are dysfunctional families. So maybe we should be screening for dysfunctional families. Well, maybe. Um, but a lot of the risk for dysfunctional families are, are societal level things, poverty, crime, that sort of stuff. So it's like, well, gee whiz, where do I start screening? You know, as, you know where, where, what level do I begin at? Um, so I can talk about that a little bit more in a second. But I, but I think that we have to be very careful and intentional about who we're screening and what we're gonna do with that information. Um, and then finally, in terms of treating and promoting relational health, um, now we're trying to find ways to make um, adversity positive instead of toxic or tolerable. Um, and this really acknowledges that it's really impossible and even undesirable to put kids in a bubble. We're not trying to put kids in a bubble. It's, it, it's impossible. Kids are going to have adversity. But can we find the ways so they can respond to it in, in a positive way? And it all comes down to these social-emotional buffers. So again, I would suggest that for the older kids, there is this thing called social-emotional learning there's a website there, uh, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. And, but for younger kids, we're looking at um, parenting and caregiver skills. But just for a moment, let's talk about those social emotional uh, skills. Formalized social emotional learning is something that um, if you go into schools and work with teachers and say, we're not changing the content of what you're teaching. What we'd like to do is work with you um, so that the process of learning is now collaborative, group-wise, and in the process, we're helping kids understand their emotions, other people's emotions, social-emotional intelligence. Not only does it um, improve attachment to school, kids are healthier, they actually in test, increase test scores, right? So I know the temptation is to think, well, you're, you're talking about character formation. You're talking about teaching morals. No, that's not what we're talking about. Social emotional skills are affect regulation, they're sometimes called non-cognitive skills, it's mindfulness, right? They go by a number of different names, but the point is they're learned. So again, if a kid's bad at math, we don't say, too bad. If a kid is having trouble understanding their emotions, we tend to say, too bad, right? We can, we can, we can teach these skills. They're learned, they're modeled, they're nurtured, they can be practiced. They effectively buffer against toxic stress and they increase test scores, which actually makes sense because the brain is an integrated organ. I sometimes talk about the brain as being like playing a game of solitaire, right? If you ever played solitaire, if you don't get all the aces, you're only going so far, right? If you don't have the social emotional skills, you're not going to go as far as you'd like to. So that brings us to a really uncomfortable thing. So in older kids, there's formalized social emotional learning. For younger kids, it's about parenting. And that makes us as pediatricians really uncomfortable because we don't want to be viewed as um, being judgmental, we don't want to be viewed as being condescending, uh, culturally incompetent, and so if a parent comes to me and says, hey, I'm having a problem, I'm happy to be the hero, da -da -da, it makes some adv advice, but, but to, to actually proffer parenting advice unsolicited, 
that makes me a little nervous. The problem is that there's really good data out there that it makes a big difference, right? If there's positive nurturing or supportive parenting, it can impact any outcomes. But the skeptics will say, look, this is a really bad idea. Just stop right there, right? For two reasons. One, our parenting skills are really teachable. And two, why would you even think about doing a universal messaging program on parenting? Um, because there's a ceiling effect. What do they mean by a ceiling effect? What they mean is some of those kids are going to do OK anyway. And funders don't like that. So if a funder, if you go to a funder and say, I want to do this universal thing, and I say, great, show me what impact you've made. You can't, show, you can't fix kids that are going to do OK anyway. And it's hard to know which kids you had an impact on. So the example I tend to use is lead poisoning, right? So you know, we know that lead is a credible threat to kids' brain development. So we got rid of it in paint, rid of it in gas. And as a consequence of that, could we show that we increased IQs across the board? Of course not. For the kids that were going to get lead poisoning, that was a life altering. But you don't know which kids that were, right? So it's really hard to show the funder, look at the impact I've made. Does that make sense, right? So the point is, toxic stress is sort of the same idea. It is a viable, incredible, serious threat to kids' brain development. We want to try and do some universal preventions as well. All right. So to my response to these two things, just be fair, right? So I would say, are they teachable? Yes, they're teachable. This idea that you're either a good parent or a bad parent is not true. Is it harder? Absolutely. We tend to parent the way we were parented. And if you had an aversive uh, childhood, it's going to be harder, but it's not impossible, right? And then the second thing is this idea of ceiling effect. Yeah, I understand it's an issue with funding. But the thing you got to remember is, what is OK? So in a lot of these studies, OK is not going to jail. OK is not dropping out of school. OK is not committing suicide, right? I hope we can do a little better than that, right? I think the gold standard needs to be safe, stable, nurturing relationships. That's what we need to be looking at. So, <clears throat> so there are significant challenges to this approach, and I understand that. The first is we need to come to some consensus about what the biological needs of children are. And I think it's safe, stable, nurturing relationships. That's not SSRIs, mind you, <laughs> right? That's SSNR, safe, stable, and nurturing relationships. That's what they need, right? Um, and if we agree that we got to meet Maslow's hierarchy, those are basic promises. They need to feel safe. They need to feel secure. They need to feel nurtured. If we agree to that, then we want to make sure that we're doing a two-generation approach to make sure kids get that. A lot of parents with some education and some universal um, messaging, they can do that. But the ones that can't, we need to find some way to meet those needs. And that's where the public health approach comes in to match excuse me, the family's needs with the indicated local services. So this two generation approach is a hot thing right now. I'm just going to go flying through this slide, but I think you guys get it. That The idea is we want to try and help the parents in order to help the kids. But even more than that, Barry Zuckerman just last month in pediatrics wrote a thing about two generation approach and said that actually engaging the kids is the best way to help the parents sometimes, right? Think about how smoking affects your baby. If you want to quit, we can talk about that, right? Um, all right. We have to understand how past experiences impact today's behaviors. That's not only true for the kids, but also true for the parents. If the parents had adverse in their childhood, that makes it a lot harder for them to be safe, stable, and nurturing. Not impossible. It just makes it harder. Um, context, again, determines everything. So, and, and there's a lot of judgment that goes along with this. So if someone's had a stressful day at work, we don't think anything about that person having a couple drinks afterwards. But now, if the woman's syndrome, that's a whole different ball of wax. So the point is that I understand these are big issues now, but I think we have to see some behaviors are not just um, malad, not just bad decisions, poor judgment, um, you know, um, character flaws. They may have been trapped in these ways of dealing with adaptions that are no longer uh, appropriate or adaptive anymore. And we need to develop healthy responses, right? So for little kids, we're going to try and label that emotion and teach an alternative, which is really important that kids know what their passion is. So when you see kids and, you know, seven, eight years old and you say, you know, what do you do on a rainy day? I play video games. Oh, big red flag, right? I mean, you got to have something else, some other way of escaping other than looking at video games, right? Um, and again, for the parents, we're looking at these uh, ideas of centering pregnancy and parenting and legacy. We're actually giving them an extended family, those social supports that we know are so important. So what would this public health, I'm running out of time, what would this public health um, approach look like? Well, if you turn them upside down, we've got universal primary preventions, things like social supports, 
um, guidance in primary care, and consistent messaging is really, really important. So there's an evidence-based intervention out there called the Communities That Care. It looks at adolescent behaviors, and it uses a social development approach where they basically carpet bomb, that seems a little violent, sorry. They have the same, the same message in the whole community, whether or not it's in school, your, um, your rec leagues, the same message, and it actually changes behavior, right? So if you a consistent message, that can be really important. So the beauty of universal primary prevention is there's no identification, there's no stigma. Everybody gets the same message. And it's not saying that there's only one way to parent. That's not what I'm talking about. There's this idea of good enough parenting, you know? What's just good enough? You just gotta have these basic things for your kid to have a chance. That's not saying there's only one way to do it. You can do your own culture, your own um, you know, morals and that sort of thing, but there's some basic things you need. What's good enough parenting? Um, and so everyone gets that same message. So there's no identification, there's no stigma, but there is a, a ceiling effect because some of those kids, again, would have done okay without it. So that makes it harder to show you've made a difference. But again, we're not gonna go put lead back in because we didn't prove it, you know, we know it's a risk. All right, so for kids that fall through that, we're gonna have targeted interventions. Again, there's nurse, uh, home visiting programs, there's parenting programs, and ideally early intervention. If it really is identifying kids at risk and not waiting until they're actually delayed, and that depends a lot on the county that you're, that you're in. There's less of a ceiling here. More of these kids are gonna do poorly unless we intervene. Um, but it does require screening and there are issues with trauma. And for kids that fall through that, there's evidence-based interventions. And the message here is that treatment works. We have treatments that work, but only if they're available. Only if they're available. So the point here is that all of these are necessary. None of them are sufficient. And that's really important because I think we tend to always look for the magic bullet, so to speak. That one thing that's gonna change everything around. This is not something that we're gonna be able to do just in the medical home. You see there are interventions here that are not necessarily medical home interventions, right? Social service interventions, um, uh, mental health interventions. And so we need to find some way to not only have, you can almost think of this as a um, vertical public health approach, we also need a horizontal public health approach where we're bringing in the education and the social services as well. All right, so the question then is, are we actually doing that? Is that the way any of our systems look like? Not that I've found, right? Where we have a real, whole pieces, of the, all the pieces of the puzzle together. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the public health implications of all this before I close. I know it's late and you're probably anxious to get out of here, but um, what we do in, in health right now, 90% of the trillions of dollars that we spend on health are on treatment and not prevention, right? That rings true, right? We're really good at curing the sick, but we're really not very good at building the well, right? Um, what we know, though, is that 70% of early deaths are preventable, 70%, and the majority of those um, are actually due to behavioral problems that lead to chronic disease. Okay, so what's causing all that? Or, and, and more particularly, those behavioral patterns, is that behavioral allostasis? Is that the stuff we were talking about at the beginning? So let's look at things here. So the proximal causes of death, the immediate causes of death are chronic disease. I think we would agree that influenza and septicemia, those are acute causes of death, right? But just about everything else, including accidents, suicide, and assault, those are actually associated with childhood adversity, right? So chronic disease, this is what's getting us. So that's the immediate cause. What, what's the distal causes? What are the upstream remote causes? Unhealthy lifestyles, and look at this, what do we see? The big five, right? And you could even argue again, death by firearms and some of these other things, toxic agents, those are also associated with childhood adversity. So the issue is, if these unhealthy lifestyles are these manifestations of behavioral allostasis, the fundamental cause is toxic stress. So there was this article that came out in Science, this was a couple years ago, that looked at the fact that by 2030, 90% of the morbidity, and this is important because I was just talking about mortality, and not to be too cynical, but we live in an era of economics and dead people don't cost anything. Um, and so as a consequence, what they're really worried about is morbidity, right? Chronic disease, that's what kills our system. So 90% of the morbidity in countries like the United States are gonna do these things they call non-communicable diseases. What are they? They're the cancer, the diabetes, the depression, and they are due to unhealthy behaviors, the big five, right? So I was really disappointed actually in this whole issue of science because the cover was health prevention. That was the title, prevention. There wasn't anything on pediatrics, nothing. But they came dangerously close in one article. So this article talked about the fact that much of the global burden disease associated with behaviors, the big five we've been talking about, right, um, that people recognize as health harming, yet continue to engage in even when undesirable consequences emerge. 
What's up with that? And what they say is these are automatic processes. If you think about it, most of what we do on a, on a daily basis is not conscious. Brushing your teeth, tying your shoes, maybe driving to work. <laughs> automatic process. Woof, we're just doing it, right? Right? And so they say, geez, you know, we really, if we want to make a big difference on chronic disease, we need to t have interventions that target those automatic processes. But what they didn't ask is, when do those automatic processes form in the first place? When? We know from the ACE study, less than 18 years old, right? They're happening on our watch, right? Right. So the issue is, do we continue to treat disease, unhealthy lifestyles that lead to disease, or the toxic stress that actually leads to the adoption of those unhealthy lifestyles in the first place? So what is toxic stress? It's a physiologic stress response that reflects an inability to turn off. You're just bathing in that toxic milieu. It results in changes in the brain, in the genome, and in behavior. Why should we care? Because it's a mediator. Toxic stress is a mediator between adversity and poor outcomes, not only in health, but also in learning and behavior. And by understanding that biology, we're in a much better place to do primary prevention and early intervention, and it all comes down to this idea of relational health. So what can we do about it? Education. That's what we're talking about today. That's why David's beating me up, is we're going to talk and, and educate people about the science, um, toxic stress, and this eco-biodevelopmental framework. Um, there's issues with messaging. So again, as pediatricians, we're good advocates, right? We can be out there messaging and saying, we need to uh, have a shared vision about toxic stress, and we need to um, apply a public health approach. There's issues for advocacy. Again, as pediatricians, we're great advocates, and we can say, look, you know, this is something that's going to uh, make a big difference in the long run, and we can advocate for programs that incentivize wellness, not just curing the sick, but actually building the well. There's huge opportunities for research, which is why the academic centers are involved. We need basic research to look at non-invasive biomarkers. Um, we also need clinical research so we can develop standardized screens, not just for the child, and, not just for the, and also for the family, and not just dysfunction, but actually those are at risk. Uh, and then we also need to work in translation. How do we work with medical homes, schools, and communities to make sure that we have uh, an alignment both vertically and horizontally? Um, and then finally, it really comes down to practice transformation. Of course, all these things lead up to it. So we need education so the next generation providers understand development-informed care. Um, we need to uh, have research so we actually can see we're making a difference. And practice transformation at the state level can actually be accomplished through chapters, the AAP chapter. So in Ohio, we have a number of quality improvement initiatives where we actually offer MOC credit. So we're doing quality improvement. Physicians are getting MOC credit, and we're actually changing the way practice happens. So I'm going to one more slide. You're almost there. Um, so since uh, there are known and established ways to treat, mitigate, and prevent toxic stress, and then the flip side, to repair, eliminate barriers to, and actually promote relational health, what's up? Why aren't we doing them? I'm not sure I have a great answer, but I have heard some things. Number one, people will say, they cost too much, you know, or toxic stress, that's not my concern. Well, when kids don't fulfill their potential, we all lose. If we don't invest early, we're going to pay for their incarceration and their extra educational problems down the line. Instead of them paying into the system, we're paying out, right? Defensiveness, you know, hey, this isn't my fault. It's about those kids. It's about those kids, right? Right. Toxic stress is not restricted by race, wealth, or zip code. It is true. If you grow up in poverty in certain zip codes, you have more precipitance, more higher probability of having a toxic stress response. But believe me, that doesn't, you know, growing up in, in every material advantage does not preclude toxic stress. If you've got two parents that are big time professionals and they don't have time for you, you're still gonna have toxic stress. So you can look at like the kids that committed Columbine, right? They weren't kids that were in a, in a situation you would think would have toxic stress. Clearly there was some toxic stress there, right? Um, it's too complicated. It's just, you know, it's intractable. All these things. You got poverty. You got parenting. Ugh, too much, you know. The biology says it's really all about the relationships. It's really about relationships. Um, and people say, well, you know, it's too hard. It is hard. Um, but if we understand the science, we advocate for a public health approach, and we develop sort of a shared language, you know, toxic stress, relational health, then I think maybe we have a chance. So I have no illusions that trans this into what we do in terms of education of future health professionals, inter 
professional education in terms of how we practice is going to be easy. But hopefully I've convinced you that it really is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and so when the going gets tough, we need to remember that it's always easier to build strong children than to repair a broken man. And I'd be happy to take some questions. Yes, sir. We're trying. Um, so there are some resources out there. So the Academy is very interested in this. Um, uh, there is um, a website to the Academy. So if you go to www.aap.org slash EBCD, stand for Early Brain and Child Development. I'll say it again, www.aap dot org slash ebcd if you go to that website um, there actually are modules in there specifically designed for training programs so everything's there it's a canned talk there are like five of them right one talks about aces one talks about toxic stress one talks about interventions you can do you know so they're all there so yes we're trying to reach out so you know if you um, are looking for an easy talk it's all done for you No, not yet. Not yet. We're working on it. We're working on it. But you know, the truth is, this, in my opinion, isn't just a pediatric issue, right? So the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study was done by an internal medicine doc, right, who couldn't figure out why all of his superstars that lost tons of weight, he was running an obesity clinic, why all his superstars were losing tons of weight were invariably the ones that relapsed over and over again, and he could not figure it out. And that's how he found out about all these people having early childhood adversity. So, so I think that while pediatrics and Felitti, who ran the ACE study, will tell you, we've, pediatrics has embraced this information. Um, other forms of medicine, not so much, right? They're not thinking longitudinally. I'm just dealing with what's here and now. Um, and so I think we need to even go upstream from pediatric training to medical school training, right? And that's why I said a little spiel that I said before about um, uh, we're really doing the next generation of physicians in general a disservice if we're saying, look, these um, social determinants of health are really, really important, but we're not changing their perspective from one of I can and must fix this to one I just need to be present and empathic and get back to the therapeutic relationship. Otherwise, if we think there's burnout now, whew, there's a tidal wave coming. Yeah, I'll continue to say, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so when you're dealing about psychiatric medications in kids, there's preciously little data out there. Now, that's not saying that for some things we don't. So clearly, um, the SSRIs have a huge impact on kids with anxiety. And those are short-term medicines. They're not medicines you're on for the rest of your life. Um, and um, I think there's good data out there about um, if you have the diagnosis right, that ADHD medicines can prevent some problems down the line. But a lot of kids that I see that have ADHD don't really have ADHD, right? They have trauma. They have trauma, right? And so if you want to think about it from a brain standpoint, ADHD, we think, is a deficit in executive function. It's really hard, I think, to see, is it a deficit in executive function? The prefrontal cortex isn't working well just because it's not working well, because it runs in the family, it's genetic, or whatever. Or is it not working well because the amygdala is screaming all the time, right? Because we know that shuts down the prefrontal cortex, right? So I mean, I think it's really hard to tease that apart. And actually, I don't know when it's coming out, but there is going to be um, a report from the Academy, an update on ADHD. And it's going to say, you know, a lot of what we call ADHD may not be ADHD, right? It's, it's really the, the ecology's wrong. Do you know what I mean? But I guess my question is, would it be a form of prevention? Well, I don't think we know that very well. Yeah, I don't think we know that. And I think that, um, I think that because the brain is still developing, I think we're loath to just say, here's your medicine. And the other issue is, I think it goes back to... Uh, um, a deficiency in the biomedical model. That's a very biomedical response. You're not responding well 
because there's a chemical imbalance in your brain. Here's the chemical. It's going to make a difference. The other thing, of course, is that we're bathing the brain in that chemical as to putting the chemical right where it needs to be. So, um, but an ecobiological response is, well, yeah, you may be having changes in brain chemistry, but what's triggering that? What's triggering that? And that's why I think the issue with anxiety is a good one, because once you get in that vicious cycle and the amygdala is screaming, I, I call it amygdalitis. Don't ever use that term. It's not real, right? Um, but once that amygdala is screaming, it's really hard for kids then to learn because their amygdala is screaming. So for those kids, sometimes a short episode of SSRIs is all you need so that all that counseling starts to get some traction. And now we're building skills, and now we're off the medicine because we learned those skills. But we were never actually going to learn those skills when we're in panic mode, right? So there clearly is a role for pharmacotherapy, but we have to be judicious. And the problem is, you know, when you're a hammer, all the world's a nail. So if the only quiver I have, and the only arrow I have in my quiver is medicine, we tend to overuse it. But if we have social supports like health leads, where I can write a prescription and the family can get some training and, and, and I have other options, lo and behold, we don't use medicine so much, right? So that, I think that's part of the problem, is we need to uh, empower physicians. I'll get to you in just a second. You had a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I would say that the data suggests that it's both, right? So you can clearly have one horrible traumatic event, right, that can change things. Um, but you can also have the cumulative events. So the ACE study talks about the cumulative effects. Uh, but could you have one horrible experience? Absolutely. So I'm not sure I understand the distinction between stress and distress, necessarily. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, that's it. So, I mean, I think that, that actually is the way to try and get at it, particularly with kids, um, is um, the social emotional learning is getting them to understand that there's nothing wrong with being angry. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with being scared. You know, mindfulness is really, am the science is just amazing. So, you know, if you put someone in an in a, in a MRI scanner and you have them see something that's very distressing, the, you know, the limbic system, the amygdala is lighting up. And if you just ask them, what are you feeling right now? It frontalizes it. Oh, I'm being angry. The amygdala comes down because now you're engaged in the prefrontal cortex. So that's this whole idea of mindfulness. So yes, I think having even parents understand, I started actually talking about it um, at three years old the link between the way they feel and what they're doing, the kids are, and that the parents need to help kids understand that there's a link there. You are angry. Label it. That's OK. What are we going to do about it? By hitting, spitting, screaming, punching my brother, that's not working so well for you. Why don't we try something else? Instead of just saying, no, stop it. No, 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 stop it, stop it, right? You're angry. This is the emotion. That's OK. It normalizes it. What are we going to do instead? And now we're building skills. So. Yes, I mean, there's no doubt, but at the neuroscience level, it's, it's that limbic system overdrive that's causing the emotional distress. So I think we're saying the same things, right? Am I missing your question? Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That that's that is in my that's primary prevention. That's what we're that's what we're getting at, and I think that's where we need to go. That's where we need to go. There's no no question about it. But again, good luck finding a funder. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to be cynical, but good luck finding a funder when you say, you know, 15% of these kids are going to drop out of school, and I could bring that. I can cut that in half. What you're really saying, though, is I may cut that in half, but I'm also cutting the pregnancy rate. I'm also cutting this. I'm also cutting this. You know, but I can't tell you which kids it had a difference on. So it's really hard to do those universal things. But I wholeheartedly agree with you. Absolutely. And that, that's where I get at this you know, public health approach. We need to have a message. And, and 
I've been pushing the academy really hard, and I've been an abysmal failure. They have not <laughs> given in yet. But I think we need to have a national discussion about parenting. And it's not that there's one way to do it. That's not the point. What is good enough parenting? What are the essential things you need to provide your kids so they have an equal shot and an and, and, and active shot? And, if, you don't, and if, they, if they can't provide that, don't we have an obligation as a society to somehow help those kids because it's just going to bite us in the butt in the long run? So what was the other question? Yeah. Uh, I would say that no one's put the whole pieces together. There are some societies that do some things well. Um, so there's been a big thing recently about paid maternity leave, right? So some of the um, Scandinavian countries have a whole year of paid maternity leave. Um, so there's no question that if we're, if we're really interested in relational health, <laughs> that first year is pretty important, you know? Um, and so um, there are countries that, that are, again, are looking at that. Um, there are other countries that education is free. Um, but all these countries have one thing in common is that they have higher taxes, right? They have higher taxes. Um, and so that gets really tricky. That gets political, you know? Um, so again, I think if you, just, if you get rid of the politics and you just look at the healthcare system, right? We're spending more on health than other countries. We're getting worse outcomes than other countries. And why is that? If you look at our economic peers through the uh, Association for Econ Economic Cooperation and Development, oh, what is that, OECD, right? If you look at them, um, for every dollar our peers put into health care, they put $2 into social services, right? For every dollar we put into health care, we spend 90 cents on social services, right? And then we wonder why we're having bad outcomes, right? Um, now, I would argue that that statistic, though, is part of the problem because we tend to separate them out. And I sort of see them all as being investments in human capital. <laughs> we're building the next generation of healthy workers, right? Um, the problem is not that we're not investing. We're just investing the wrong way. We're trying to cure the sick instead of build the well. Yeah, huge, huge. Well, I think, and again, I think, I, th yeah, well, I just think that was, that was just not handled well. Do you know what I mean? You know, I mean, it's all in, for heaven, for DC and the spin they can put on things. They can do a lot better job than that. You know, I mean, um, again, I, I don't think it's, it's um, I don't think it's that there's only one way to parent that we're trying to brainwash your kid, that we're trying to teach you what the morals are. It's about skill formation. These are, there are certain skills the kids need to do well. And for them to build those skills, these are certain things they need in their world, right? Um, and so that's good enough parenting. You want to go beyond that and teach them your specific culture and your specific values, and you should go for it. No one's stopping you for that. But these are the basic things that kids need to be healthy. And I think we can make an argument on a biological level, these are things kids need. You know, this is not touchy-feely fluff stuff anymore. This isn't psychobabble. This is biology. These are the things that kids need to be successful. So I think that's how I would approach it. I'm not sure it's going to be any more well-received or not. Um, does that, does that help? What, what are your thoughts? Tell me. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. If I had one message for parents, if I could only give one message to parents, it would be this. Kids don't learn well when they are scared. Period. And that is a fundamental flaw in a lot of our philosophies, right? Um, and part of it comes down to the difference between implicit memories and explicit memories. So in t less than three years of age, kids don't necessarily remember. I mean, how many of you can remember things that happened when they're two? We don't. But guess what? We actually remember emotions from that young. And there are things that can trigger those emotions. And so the point is that um, when kids are scared, they'll remember the feeling but not necessarily why and what the context was and what the specifics were. Um, so the idea that kids need to fear us uh, in order to learn, no, no. 
So that, that's the one message that I'd like to get out there. And I know people are gonna push back and I'd love to have a discussion about it. Cause I mean, the, the neuroscience is pretty clear. If your amygdala is screaming, your hippocampus isn't working, <laughs> yeah. Yes. How do you you got my hypothesis or you can show it? How can you show these changes in an adult related to sexual abuse in childhood? No, I think what we can show is that um, if um, you look at kids that have um, significant adversity, not an adult, but younger, so the correlations there in time, right? Is that necessarily what's driving all those things? I don't know, but if you, you know, for example, the telomere story I think is a fascinating one, right? So um, we know that cortisol and significant adversity can impair telomeres, the thing that's repairing the telomeres. So the thing is that, that that's an, it's not an absolute cause and effect thing, but the thing that's intriguing about that is if you look at people, just photographs, right? And we know that, tel that the telomeres are important for aging. Look at people of the same age, one, and there, there are examples online you can look at, right? People who grew up in, in, in uh, ad adverse environments versus one that had privileges. You would never guess that they're the same age. I mean, they clearly age worse, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, but to answer your specific question, um, is that changing the thing down the line? No, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that. The point is that if there's adversity, um, we know that higher levels in telomerase, and that in turn can result in shorter telomeric things. So how are you going to do an intervention to prove that, I guess is what your question I don't know if we can do that. I'm not sure there's an ethics to prove that. You know, we're going to stress someone to see if their telomeres get shorter. I'm not sure we can do that. What you're asking? So, I mean, there are studies that show that experience adversity, telomeres are shorter. Yes. Yeah. Not later on, no. Yeah, no, so. Um, I, I don't sure how you would ever do that study. <laughs> I'd love to do that. I'm not sure how you can do that. Well, what we do know is that when there are, so again, the, the maternal pregnancy is a good example. When there's stress, we know that there's changes in methylation patterns. We know those kids come out with higher cortisol levels and more HPA reactivity. So, you know, is that the only thing that's involved? I don't know, but I think when you put all the science together, it makes a pretty compelling story. But I don't, I'm not sure how you can, you know, there are, you can do lots of these studies in rats. So if that's what you're asking, I'm sure it's been done in rats. Um, but to actually do it in humans, I don't know how you do that. No, but you can reproduce animal models. Well, but you can reproduce animal models with toxic stress. That you can do, actually. Um, and there are actually a number of models. So what I would urge you to look at is the work by Meany, right? Meany and Ziff looking at methylation patterns and looking at um, uh, separation anxiety from the parent. And, whether, and there actually are models for that. So I would urge you to look at um, Michael Meany at McGill. has fascinating animals on rats and the, and the licking, right? And licking and grooming. Actually, one of the things that we had at uh, the Ohio AAP, we're really interested in licking and grooming. And so we had this little lick, lick, groom, groom. It's a little like handshake we have behind each other. You know, lick, lick, groom, groom. <laughs> licking and grooming, I know. I'm a little crazy. Sorry. Anything else? I know you all want to get out of here. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, be good. I need a shower. Whoa. It's all right. It's all right. Sign it? Yeah. Sure. My class for psychology. Okay. Right, green's the only pen I have. So. <laughs>
Do you want me to sign? I can sign in one. It might make it a little easier. Hold on here. I have a pen in here somewhere. Actually, I guess I can turn these off now. Hold on.